Good afternoon. It's good to see so many of you out here today. Uh, João Valde Almeida is uh, the head of the delegation of the European Commission and the European Council to the United States. That means that he represents um, Commission President Manuel Barroso and Council President Herman von Rompuy of the European Union in the U.S. He um, started his career as a journalist many years ago uh, after university in Portugal and also in the U.K. Uh, after several years as a working journalist, he joined the European Commission uh, and served in a variety of capacities inside the European Commission including working with um, really the last four commission presidents on a relatively close basis. He um, then uh, began working as uh, a close personal assistant of Manuel Barroso, former Portuguese prime minister and current president of the European Commission, now in his second term. Um, Ambassador Almeida worked very closely. For those of you thinking about the Foreign Service, the European Union never had a foreign service until the Treaty of Lisbon created one, and he was intimately involved in the creation uh, of that new organization. Also worked very closely with Commission President Barroso in a variety of different summit meetings. And speaking of summits, he's hard at work now uh, because in November, shortly after Thanksgiving, he'll be, the European Union will be hosting the Transatlantic Summit and we'll be working on the Transatlantic Summit, uh, which I think we'll be actually meeting at the White House at a certain point. Um, Ambassador Almeida has chosen for us today a very exciting topic with an interesting and even provocative thesis, why the euro will survive. Uh, please join me in welcoming to BYU Ambassador Almeida. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, for uh, the opportunity to visit uh, Salt Lake City and, and BYU and the state of Utah, but most of all for the, for the opportunity of being with you uh, today. And I thank you for coming. You have a lot to do in your university time, so it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk to you. Uh, I chose uh, a, a provocative theme and one that uh, is a dangerous one because if ever the uh, euro does not survive, you won't be see you won't see me again <laughs> because uh, I wouldn't dare showing up. Uh, but it also reveals the level of my trust in the, in the European Union, the trust in the euro, because I have no doubts that the euro will survive. And my point today, before I take your questions, would be briefly to uh, try to explain why. Uh, why we're talking about a crisis in the euro area, and secondly, to try to explain to you why I think that the euro will survive uh, this particular crisis. So why, uh, why do we say that there is a crisis in the euro area? And, uh, you know, read my words, crisis in the euro area. I'm not saying there is a crisis in the European Union. I don't say that the European e Union is about to collapse, and, and I'm not even saying that the euro is about to collapse. I'm saying there is a crisis inside the euro area. Well, first of all, because uh, we had in 2008, 7, 8, a very serious financial crisis. And we should not forget that this crisis was the most important one since uh, the 30s in the past century and that this crisis has a serious impact on all our economies. European, America, emerging economies, developing economies. This crisis uh, reached its peak in 2008, but like uh, earthquakes, crises have aftershocks. Their effects are prolonged in time. They assume different aspects and they touch upon different areas of our economic systems. What we're having in Europe uh, today is an aftershock of the financial crisis of 2008. An aftershock that is affecting particularly the public finances of our member states. As much as it has affected the public finances of many other economies, including the United States. In Europe, the effects of this aftershock 
have been particularly acute, of course, in the most vulnerable countries of the euro area. Some are especially affected or particularly affected. You've heard about Greece, you've heard about Ireland, you've heard about Portugal. These were the first wave of countries affected particularly by these aftershocks. Now, you also have to consider that these effects on these countries uh, are felt beyond their borders because these countries are part of an integrated economic area. So if you think about Greece, you can you know, limit yourself to the borders of Greece, the Greek economy, but you have to consider that Greek, Greece is part of a system. It's part of an integrated economic area. It's part of a single currency area. Greece shares the monetary policy of 16 other countries, which is run by a single European Central Bank. So problems in Greece in a, an integrated space are likely to affect the whole of uh, the system. And one of the reasons for this particular crisis is that, and we have no problem in recognizing that, this system was maybe not fully equipped to deal with this type of crisis. So you not only have countries particularly affected, you not only have these countries affecting the system because they are part of it, you also have the system being, you know, finding it difficult to respond to this particular crisis because it did not have necessarily all the mechanisms that are required. They did not, we did not have mechanisms to come to, you know, the rescue of countries in, in difficulty, as much as we did not have the mechanisms to take decisions compatible with, you know, the speed of events and the urgency of the situation. So these are some of the reasons that explain why we have today a crisis in the euro area. And they are largely economic or in the domain of governance. But there are some political reasons as well. I believe that our public opinion in the euro area, in Europe in general, was not uh, prepared to the degree of seriousness of this crisis uh, and its effects in our system. There are domestic uh, political considerations that were more important in some countries than the general appreciation of the situation in Europe. And of course, this complicates the process of coming and defining solutions for the euro area problems. Uh, you know the domestic debate in the US. You know how intense it is, how lively it is, how polarized it is sometimes. Well, we have the same kind of debate in Europe inside each of the area, uh, countries of the euro area. So when, on, in addition to the normal debate in a country between government and opposition between the different institutions. You add the fact that this public opinion has to deal with problems coming from other countries that affect you. It, of course, complicates the, the way you take decisions. It uh, you know, slows down the decision-making process. And this is part of the explanation for, what, uh, for the reasons why you see for so many months now Europe crisis in the front lines of uh, newspapers here in America. Speaking of America, another factor that complicates and largely explains as well the crisis in the euro area is the international environment. We dealt relatively well with the first impact of the 2008 crisis. We are maybe doing slightly less well in dealing with the aftershocks of the financial crisis. And I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about partners of the European Union. I'm talking about members of the G20. All of those that have to contribute to creating the right environment. So the international environment of the euro area crisis is not helping either. And this is another reason to explain 
we have economic reasons, governance reasons, political reasons, and international environment reasons that explain why uh, one should consider today that the euro area is going through a crisis uh, period. Now, what have we done about this? Uh, a few words about that uh, to try to explain to you that we are on the right track for a solution of this crisis. So, to be simple but still complete, we address the most urgent cases, Ireland, Greece, Portugal. These countries found themselves in an unsustainable position in terms of the levels of debt, the levels of budgetary deficit. They had to be rescued. We came to their rescue, the European Union, with the support of the International Monetary Fund and through the IMF with the support of countries like uh, America, the United States. We designed new instruments that did not exist before. I, uh, I referred earlier, crisis mechanisms, rescue mechanisms. They did not exist before. They were created in the last 18 months in order to react to this situation. We decided that these mechanisms will become permanent mechanisms. So they were not only valid for this period, they will stay there later in the year. And we are in the process of changing our own sort of constitution of the European Union, which we call the, the Treaty of Lisbon uh, as it stands uh, today. But we realized and our leader re leaders realized that we needed more than that. And very recently, we approved a comprehensive plan. Not going into the details, it's too technical. But basically, we need to do more about Greece. And we are doing more about Greece. In order to really stabilize the country, which has now attained unsustainable levels of, of debt. We are maximizing the capacity, the firepower of our crisis mechanism. We are putting more money on the table to be able to react to existing and possible future situations of crisis in Europe. We are looking and working with the banking system. No economy can work without a solid, efficient banking system. We may like the banks or not, we cannot live without them. And we live better if they are in, sound, in a sound position to help the economy. So we need to recapitalize some of our banks we need to provide them with better funding so that they can support the real economy. But no austerity, no m measures of this kind that have, that, you know, reflect into sacrifices for our citizens, it doesn't make any sense if you don't have a perspective of growth. If you don't do this in order to create conditions for more growth, more jobs, more prosperity for our citizens. Citizens will not support it if they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, I, I, if, the, if they, they don't see the rationale for the sacrifice, meaning more growth and more jobs in the future. So we are using the crisis period to try to introduce some fundamental reforms in our economies, in the way we organize our uh, societies. It has to do with pension, retirement age, it has to do with the financing of welfare uh, systems. It has to do with the labor market and how much it can adapt to uh, demand. It has to do with education and skills and innovation. If we want to be competitive with the emerging economies, we need to bet on innovation, research, education. What you're doing here is part of the response of industrialized societies to the new challenges. And we need to organize the way we make decisions in a different way. That's why you have a discussion in Europe about changing the treaties. That's why you have a discussion about not allowing a single member state to develop its own uh, budget, uh, budgetary policy without a mechanisms of monitoring and surveillance by the others. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we're talking about here is the fact that 17 countries have one currency, one monetary policy, you know, the policy that determines the, the, the interest rates uh, and the level of the currency in the international markets, and I'm oversimplifying here, <laughs> shortcutting. Uh, this has been integrated, but the economic policies of these 17 countries, you know, where they spend the money, how much do they borrow, 
what kind of priorities for uh, public expenditure. All of this had been left up to now to the single national uh, domain. Now we are bringing all this together so that we have a more harmonized, harmonized management of, uh, of the euro area. So some of the reasons for the crisis, some of what we are doing to address the crisis, and now to conclude why I think that on the basis of all this, having all this as a background, uh, why do we believe that the euro will survive? Well, first of all, uh, for a number of economic reasons. It makes sense for an economic space where people circulate freely, where capitals circulate freely, where goods circulate freely, and where services circulate freely, where people can work and choose the place where they work, where capitals and investments can go across the borders without any problem, where you can uh, buy services from everywhere in the Union, it simply makes sense to have a single currency. Otherwise, the currency becomes an obstacle to the fulfillment of our objectives by creating a single market and by allowing all these uh, factors to circulate freely. So it makes sense from an economic point of view if our purpose is, as it is, to create more prosperity inside Europe by creating a uh, large single market in our uh, continent. Second reason is that uh, the track record of the euro is a positive one. It has been good for business and for consumers. If you take inflation, for instance, we have kept inflations, inflation in the euro area roughly around our target of 2%. Uh, in the previous decades, it was between 6 and 9%. Inflation is sometimes overlooked, and people say, but why this focus on inflation? Well, inflation is a condition for uh, economic uh, development and growth. Inflation is the most antisocial economic indicator. It affects particularly those more in need. It is a source of inequality also in our societies. Secondly, monetary stability. You know, 70 currencies merged into one. Just imagine, imagine that we would have gone through all these financial crises, financial turmoil, having 17 currencies instead of one. And one strong currency, the euro is today still a very strong currency, second to, uh, to the dollar in international, uh, as an international reserve currency. Imagine our small countries, but even the bigger ones, having to weather the storm throughout this crisis uh, with smaller currencies. But also on employment. In the first decade of the euro, we were able to create more than 16 million jobs in the, in the euro area. And last but not least, uh, because having the euro enhances our role in the world. For these countries, having a single currency in, international, uh, in the international scene and the currency, which is a strong one, reinforces our capacity to dialogue, to negotiate, to intervene and to influence what happens in the international scene. And this is, of course, extremely important. But we have to consider when we assess the economic reasons why I believe the euro will survive, you have to assess the cost of the non-euro. I mean, it is clear today that if the euro breaks down, the costs of this operation will be far more important than the costs of keeping it together. Because there are costs involved in keeping it together, as we have seen. But the costs of breaking it down, of managing the day after of the collapse of the euro, will be immensely more important. And most of them, they will be unpredictable because uh, you know, it has not happened in the past with this magnitude. So we have to bear in mind the alternative. And these costs will impact not only upon the countries of the, what we call the periphery, like some of those that I mentioned earlier, 
they will also have an impact on the central countries of the euro area, like Germany or France or the, or the Netherlands. But there are a set of political reasons why, I believe, and maybe this is even more important than economic ones, why the euro, I believe, will survive. And the first is because the euro is a central feature of our project. What is our project, you may ask? Well, our project in Europe is very simple. is to have in that region of the world you see there, uh, in the center of the map, because maps have been always produced by people in the Western world, so <laughs> we tend to put ourselves in the middle of it. Uh, but uh, as you know, you can look at the way, at the world in different other ways, but you know, in our way of looking at the world, we are at the center. So our project is for these countries, and you, you see today, uh, Europe goes from the west coast of Portugal, where I was born, to uh, the border of Russia, very soon from up there where you see Iceland, uh, all the way to the coast of Libya or the coast of Israel, where we have two small islands, Malta and Cyprus. This is continental Europe uh, today, and, and 500 million people, half a billion people, living in peace, uh, prosperity, uh, democracy, individual freedom, protection of human rights, good welfare systems, good environmental standards, good consumer protection standards. This is Europe today. And we achieved this in 50 something years of European integration after two civil wars in Europe. So our project, I think, is clear. The euro is part of it. The euro is not a, a gadget. The euro is part of the mechanisms and the tools that we have to keep these entities together, these countries together, these peoples together, these economies together. The project of our founding fathers, we also had founding fathers like the Americans. Um, our founding fathers project was that one. Let's create so many links, such a degree of interdependence and interconnection among people that war would no longer make any sense. So let's make war something totally irrelevant or totally useless or total unthinkable. This is our project. The euro is part of that because by having a single currency, you bring the economies together, you bring people together, and you reinforce the foundation of this project. So this is a reason why if you abandon the euro, if you, if you let the euro go, you are in fact damaging the whole rationale of your project. A failure of the euro will affect the credibility of our project. We can survive the euro, let's be frank. You can imagine a scenario in Europe, Europe decides, okay, this is not going very well, let's go back to uh, national currencies. It will not necessarily mean the, the, the end of the European Union, but it will have a reputational cost. It will, it will impact upon our credibility, upon our sustainability, future sustainability of, um, of, uh, of our project and, you know, should be taken account for. So I think that for very down-to-earth economic reasons, for uh, very solid political reasons, I don't see uh, our leaders, our public opinions, wanting or accepting the idea that we should allow the euro to go down. On the contrary, and the last weeks have reinforced my belief that fundamentally our leaders and our public opinions have realized that the risks of a derailing of the euro area are too high. Uh, that it requires, the present situation requires, a full uh, mobilization of our political will across the European Union to create the conditions for it to go further and deepen. And today what we're talking about in Europe is not how much we want to destroy what took so many years to build. 
what we are discussing today in Europe is how fast and how far do we want to move forward. This is the debate in Europe, a difficult debate. I recognize we have 27 countries, 27 democracies, 27 governments, 27 oppositions, 27 parliaments plus the European Parliament. It makes a lot of noise, right? It makes a lot of headlines in the newspapers. Uh, journalists like that, great news coming out of Europe. Uh, other people like it because, you know, it distracts the public opinion from other problems, uh, which is useful, particularly in times of, uh, you know, when elections are coming up and all that. So I understand all that, and I'm not talking about any specific country. Uh, so you will continue to have Europe on the front pages. You will continue to have Europe being here and there blamed for the state of the world economy. Uh, we are used to that and we can live with that. Uh, but when you look at the news, please have in mind some of what I said to you today and try to detect with your own judgment uh, how much you see our leaders committed to creating the conditions to guarantee the future of the Europe. This is my belief. If I'm wrong, you will not invite me again. If I'm right, maybe I'll come back next year to give you some more details about how <laughs> successful we were in uh, in overcoming our crisis. Thank you. So, His Excellency, we're going to take some questions. We just have the basic ground rules. Wait for the microphone to come to you. Wait, raise your hand and, and then tell us your name and what you're studying before you ask your question. So, first question. Always the smartest one. There you go. The first gets the best mark, right? <laughs> my, my, my name is Ben Hansen. I'm a political science major. I've heard a lot of people say that in order for the euro to survive, a central fiscal authority has to be established. I'm just like, it has to be established or else in the long run, no, nothing will happen. <coughs> I'm just wondering if you agree with that and what will it take in order for that to happen? Well, I said earlier that we are discussing how much we should uh, move uh, forward and how fast and how far should we get. And that is, that is the reality. If you look at all the measures we took since the beginning of this crisis, not a single measure means less integration or, as we say, less Europe. Every single measure represents moving forward in the European integration. So some people talk about fiscal union. Uh, by the way, I don't know if these concepts are e totally harmonized across the Atlantic. Uh, my point is every measure we're taking, the direction of our action, the trend is one that leads to more integration. How far w would we get at the end? I don't know. I cannot predict. Because if I ask the founding fathers of the Union uh, 50 years ago, if they thought that we will ever get to where we are today, they would say, this guy uh, is a little bit out of, uh, of this world uh, because, you know, it was unthinkable. Some of the measures we're taking today were unthinkable two years ago, 18 months ago, right? So uh, we are very creative, so I don't know how far we will go. But the sense and the direction, as I explained, is for countries to allow and accept to share a little bit more, if not a lot more, of their sovereignty to, with the others, so that they can collectively find solutions for the problems. Uh, and that's the direction we're taking right now. The second also gets a very good mark. Huh? Hi, my name is Aaron Day, and I'm, a his, and I'm a history and economics major here at BYU. My question for you is, if uh, the Greek parliament is unable to con come to a, a consensus on its austerity measures and doesn't fulfill the requirements set by the International Monetary Fund and the European Union at large, how, how would a potential withdrawal from the euro currency be organized by the Greek government? Well, rule number one, don't reply to if scenarios. Rule number two, don't mention a plan B. <laughs> uh, 
and as a good diplomat, I have to <laughs> respect the rules. Um, <laughs> let me find a creative way of replying to your question. Uh, the first one is to say that we are very happy to see that the <clears throat> uh, Greeks, uh, as a new prime minister, rather we are very happy to see that they were able to overcome uh, the decision of the previous prime minister to resign. A new prime minister has been appointed. I believe the government is now uh, being sworn in. Uh, and uh, this is good news. Uh, the new prime minister is a very competent economist, the former vice president of the European Central Bank, someone we know very well in Brussels, and we trust him to steer the country in the next month uh, in, the, in the right direction. So we are confident that Greece will implement the measures it's committed to implement. In doing so, it will be allowed to receive the you know, a new rescue uh, support from uh, the European Union and the IMF, and in doing so, creating the conditions for uh, an eventual uh, redressing of their uh, public finances. So this is what we are working on. Um, as I said earlier, any breaking down of the euro area, partial or total, will have huge costs for the whole system, for those who may be forced or tempted or wish to go out, and for those who stay in. And if they all go out, for, all, for everybody. So the costs of a non-euro should not be underestimated. On the contrary, they are likely to be, to be huge. So we need to be very attentive. Sometimes uh, people tend to have simple solutions for very complex problems. And uh, you are studying here exactly to realize yourselves that there are no simple solutions for complex problems. There are only complex solutions for complex problems. And sometimes complex solutions for simple problems, <laughs> which is even more sophisticated. But that's, that's what you bring to society. You people with, young people with solid training and formation as you have here, that's your contribution to society. You know, uh, stop these debates that I sometimes see uh, in our countries of, uh, uh, you know, simplistic views about complex uh, problems. Things are more complex than they think. And some people come with simple solutions. They, they forget uh, part of the reality, if not the whole reality. So, without breaking my rules, any breaking down of the euro would have huge consequences. This should be taken in comparison what the, the, the costs that are involved in finding solutions. So I believe that Greece is on the right track. I believe that uh, overcoming the political um, discussions taking place in the last week or so is a good thing for Greece and a good thing for Europe. My question is, why would strong nations such as Germany consent to give up their sovereignty and wealth in attempt to save what they see as a sinking ship? Very good questions, although I could not subscribe your <laughs> the exact words you used, but the question is very good and raises a, a very important point. And, uh, you know, let's be blunt about it. Uh, why is Germany interested in paying for uh, th this whole operation? I think you have to go back in history in the recent history of Europe to understand where we come from. You have to understand how important the European Union was for the reconstruction of Germany after the war. And I mean physical reconstruction, but not only. The pride of Germany, the dynamism of the German economy, the place of Germany in the world, the reunification of Germany after the fall of the Iron Curtain, all of this was possible by European integration. It would have been much different and maybe less successful without uh, the European Union. If you see today Germans, Germany's uh, world economic commercial uh, competitiveness, it has a lot to do with the fact that Germany works 
and operates in a market of half a billion consumers. This is the bedrock for the capacity of Germany to be uh, so competitive in the world, in the world markets. I mean, if you think of the past history, you will realize that a German reunification would not have been as successful as it was without full European endorsement, full European support, even financially. So I say all this as an illustration of my basic point, which is to say Germany is one, if not the biggest beneficiary of European integration and the euro area. That's my starting point. If they are the biggest beneficiary, they are the ones more interested than anybody else in safeguarding the euro, in making sure that the euro survives, in making sure that this economic space stays and remains uh, united. So I know that there is a debate in Germany about the bailout. I'm very happy to see that this debate is evolving. And most of all, I'm happy to refer to, you know, various and different and repeated statements by Chancellor Merkel to say that she wants to preserve the euro area and that it's important for Greece to stay in the euro area, respecting the conditions and implementing the measures that are necessary, but ultimately it is good for Europe, it is good for Germany, it is good for Greece. It, it is good for all of us to preserve, promote, and reinforce uh, the euro area. So it's another example where we need to go beyond a, a simplistic view of things, like why should I, German taxpayer, pay for the, the Greek one, and to look at the wider picture. And I think the German public opinion, certainly Mrs. Merkel, certainly a majority in the, in the German parliament, and I'm sure a majority of the German population is very much aware of the wider picture. Your Excellency, thank you for your comments on the Euro and helping us to restore faith in the Euro area. My name is Matt Brigham. I'm studying international relations. And my question shifts the tone a little bit. Uh, Many of us here are students studying liberal, liberal arts, and uh, we intend to pursue a career in diplomacy. You studied history at the University of Lisbon. How has your experience there helped you to prepare for your career in diplomacy? I, I replied to a similar question the other day in Montana, and I said, you have to be at the right moment at the right place, or at the right place at the right <laughs> moment. You choose. Uh, and life, you will see, uh, is made of, uh, you know, that, uh, those moments where you're in the right place at the right moment. So there's no secret formula to get to where you are. You, each of you will have to find its own way. But uh, uh, there is one strong condition, which is a good education, a good training, uh, one that, uh, you know, opens your mind to different influences. Uh, I, I say normally that, uh, you know, some interest for history, I don't even consider myself an historian because I never exercised that role and that profession, but history gives you at least uh, the reflex uh, to, to look back. And by looking back, you, you sort of try to understand where you come from, but, you know, you also see situations which have some similarity with the ones you are trying to deal with uh, today. So that gives you a sense of perspective uh, on the, the reality upon which you have to, to work. And the other influence I had, I must say, maybe even more important, was uh, what I did as a very young man as a, as a journalist. And I understand some people here may be interested by, by that as well. Uh, journalism gives you a uh, capacity to uh, understand reality, the tools to understand reality the tools to uh, manipulate facts and figures and, and data, and a certain capacity to communicate. Uh, 
and to organize your thoughts, to prioritize, to put things in perspective. Uh, look at the details without forgetting the wider, the wider picture. Well, that's what I can say. The rest is right moment, right place. Uh, you know, ambition, uh, taking some risks, and, uh, and enjoying, uh, you know, knowing what goes on in the world, curiosity, tolerance, openness to the outside. You know, some of the things that I hope, and I'm sure from what I've seen, are taught in this, in this university as well. Hi, my name is Cameron Christensen, and I'm studying political science. What are your thoughts on Italy's political and economic situation in the past couple of weeks? Well, as I said, for Greece, uh, we were following the political discussion in Italy. You know, one of our principles, as I said earlier, is full respect for democracy. The European Union is a democratic body. Democracy is one fundamental value of ours. So we have to respect the debate. Uh, we have to respect the, the domestic political uh, discussions. And we are aware of the fact that this crisis, because it is serious, because it requires very uh, courageous uh, measures taken by national governments, this crisis has an impact in domestic politics. A number of countries, a number of governments have fallen uh, in the context of this crisis. Ireland had a change of government in the middle of this crisis. Portugal had a change of government just a few months ago, largely as a result of, of the difficulties of managing the crisis. As you've seen, Greece has just changed the, the prime minister. So it's not strange that this will have also an impact in a country like Italy, which has been submitted to, subject to some pressure from the markets in, in recent days, that has to adapt, adopt a very serious and far-reaching program, and I'm very happy to see that the second, uh, I mean, the Senate has now approved as much as the, as the, as the House, uh, the, the new package of measures. We will see now what the debate produces. So I'm not surprised by the crisis having an impact in a national political, uh, national political debate. We look forward now to see what, following the announcement of the resignation of Prime Minister Berlusconi, what kind of solution may be found. Maybe it's already found, and I, I haven't been following the news for the last couple of hours. Um, there are different possibilities on the table. So it's not a surprise. It's not strange that it has an impact. But of course, we would like these discussions to result into solutions. Uh, as we have seen in Greece, let's wait and see what uh, Italians prepare for us. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm no doubt that the Italian country, Italy is a big country, a uh, very important country in the euro area in the European Union, a founding member of the European Union. Uh, I'm no doubt that uh, Italy would find the right way and will overcome this, uh, the political discussions that took place in the last few days, that the markets will be reassured by uh, uh, what is happening now and that we'll return to a more normal situation. As you wish. My name is Ashley Burge and I'm a European Studies major. Uh, Your Excellency talked about how the Euro uh, integrates countries and the benefits of those uh, of that integration. My question is, for countries that have decided to not um, adopt the euro, how has this decision affected their involvement in the EU in the EU at this time? Well, uh, the facts are the, are the following. So in the European Union, which is the let's say the wider circle, we have 27 countries, as I said, 500 million people. Out of this 27, 17 have already joined the euro. All the other members of the European Union, with a few exceptions, are supposed to join the euro. It's not even an option. It's something that is foreseen in the contract that they made with the European Union, that they should eventually join. When the conditions are ready, 
they will join the euro. Some countries like the UK and Denmark have guaranteed what we call an opt-out. They, the others have agreed that they will never join the, the euro unless they change their mind and a new contract is made. So we are expecting between 17 and 25 to join the euro eventually. And others, the two others to, for the moment, stay outside. So out of these countries that are part of the 25 and not part of the 17, some have already decided that they will definitely join the euro and are preparing very hard, uh, decided more or less when they want to join. Others have not yet come to terms with that reality in a substantial way. But they are eventually supposed to join. So this is the, these are the facts. The present state of the debate, and that's where your question aims at, is that the 17 countries as a response to the crisis, and as I said earlier, are moving very fast towards even stronger integration in that area. The other 10 who are still out, some because they will never be, some because they are not yet there, the others are you know, looking at this and saying, you know, we need to, we want to be involved, we need to keep contact with you, we don't want you know, to be totally separated from that. And this has been discussed inside the European Union. And uh, in, in recent weeks, uh, the highest level, people were discussing this. And the conclusions were that, uh, of course, the 17 have the right to move as fast as they want and as far as they want. The 10 have the right to request and to be associated with these decisions. And that's the way we're working. You know, if you take a, a, a summit of the union, you first have the meeting of the 27 leaders, heads of state and government, prime ministers the President of the Commission and the President of the European Council, and then you have a meeting of the 17 heads of state and government, also with the two institutions. So there is a possibility of articulation between the two, uh, and that's important that we achieve that, because we don't want to, again, not only break down the euro area, we don't want to break down the, the European Union as such, because these countries are very important. This being said, uh, it is clear that the 10 are affected by what the 17 decide. Because apart from the euro, they have a common economic space. They have common policies. They are very much integrated economies. If you think of the UK, which is one of the countries which has an opt-out from the euro, of course they are you know, strongly interconnected with the continental Europe, as they sometimes colors, uh, economic, trade, investment, financial links, extremely uh, integrated. So it's only normal that the 10 look attentively to what the 17 are doing, as it is normal that the 17, when they act among themselves, they have in mind the impact on the entire, uh, on the entire European Union. And this is uh, part of the issues that we need to discuss and, and manage in this uh, difficult period. Maybe a last question, if you allow, as a sense of uh, openness on my side, uh, because I enjoy debating with you. But uh, is there a last, very last question? Please. Hi, my name is Tim Lee. I'm studying Portuguese. Obrigado. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, as a follow-up to that, what is the <coughs> thinking of, in the halls of power, the internal thinking of the European Union on the UK and Denmark not adopting the euro and its long-term impact on the euro? Well, first is their choice, and we have to respect their choice. We prefer them to be in, and that's, that's only normal, that we want them to join us. You know, there was, in, uh, particularly in Denmark, there was uh, a few years ago, there was... Uh, a debate, and I know there's some people with strong links with Denmark here. There was a debate about the possibility of calling a referendum to reverse the, the opt-out. And uh, I remember uh, the, the then Prime Minister, uh, uh, you know, evoking that, that possibility. Um, 
you know, maybe even in the UK at in some certain point in time a few years ago, there was a hint of the possibility of that happening. Uh, well, it's not necessarily the case today, I must say, uh, in either of these countries, uh, but you never know. Again, in the European Union, uh, this is such a dynamic process, such an incremental process, and this is the last thought I would like to, to leave with you. Uh, you should not think of this project European Union as something that someone 50 years ago wrote down in a paper. It, we never had a blueprint that would say you now do this, 10 years later you do that, 25 years later you must have a, a, a common currency. No, it has always been a part of a process, a step-by-step -step approach to close, ever closer union as we say in our founding uh, treaty. And uh, in fact what we do, we, we we take a step, and then uh, if it's a nice step, if we are happy, maybe people are tempted, and the, if the economic environment is good, which is also very helpful, people, you know, are tempted to make another step. You know, like a child, w no, you know, learning how to walk. I mean, you go and if, you know, okay, let's take another one. Uh, uh, but then, you know, a crisis happens and the child falls down and, uh, you know, he has to reassess the situation again. And we are learning from each crisis that we have. And if you look at the past history, it's more a process driven by lessons learned from crises uh, that we were able to overcome than by a, a, a blueprint that was established in the beginning. So this incremental, step-by-step, -step, gradual uh, building of, uh, of, uh, of a never-closer union is how we operate. So. I believe that this crisis is once again proving that we are capable of learning from the mistakes, capable of overcoming this crisis by further steps in the sense of uh, the integration of, of, our, of our economy. So I cannot predict what will be uh, in the future. Uh, I sense that this crisis will be solved by more Europe, not by less Europe. And in doing so, I think, Americans and all of you can count on, on, on these countries as a group, as individual countries, which they will remain. We want these countries to remain with their own languages, with their own identities, with their own cultures. We are not in the business of abolishing nation states. We are in the process of bringing nation states closer together because it is in their interest, individual and collective interest, to do this in a globalized economy uh, we can only, uh, you know, promote and protect our interests by being united. This is the whole project, and uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, I'm sure it's not only a question of faith, it's the rational approach to this. I think all uh, the reasons point to the fact that the Europe will overcome this crisis, the euro area will overcome this crisis, and uh, in doing so, we will uh, contribute, I believe, to the next cycle of our a sustainable recovery in the world economy, for which I'm sure the U.S. will also contribute uh, according to its own responsibilities. Thank you very much for being here today.